Now, the first thing, first thing I want to argue here is that uh, volitional libertarianism, the, uh, the view that uh, free will exists and determinism is false, is not any wrong, it's self-contradictory. It's like a square circle or a married bachelor, it cannot be true. So this is going to be my first claim here, and I'm going to try and make, uh, I'm trying to try and give you a, an argument that this, is, that this is so, and I'm going to try and um, get this across by explaining it in a number of different ways. So first, libertarianism. is libertarianism, which equals free willism and indeterminism, so libertarianism or volitional libertarianism, I would like to call it, is the combination of free willism and indeterminism, it says free will exists and determinism is not true, at least as far as the human brain is concerned. And I claim that this doctrine is self-contradictory, that all you have to do is figure out exactly what it's saying and you will see that it cannot be true. So here's my, here's my basic argument. Premise one. Libertarianism says that free will, which is us determining, right, us determining our own actions. and that indeterminism nothing is determined is true. Now, um, you, might, you might want to restrict this claim to volitional indeterminism, which says that in our volitional system, in whatever it is that human beings have, the results in them doing stuff is indeterministic. So we don't have to think about indeterminism outside of our skulls. We only have to think about indeterminism in our skulls and in the parts of our brains that make us do stuff. Right, so that's volitional indeterminism. It's not really talking about indeterminism outside of the brain. It doesn't really make any claim about that. It just makes a claim about indeterminism regarding the will. Right, it's not the claim that the human volitional system is deterministic and something else has indeterminism. It says the human brain system is indeterministic and that we determine our own actions. Determinism is false. What we, do, what we think is not determined by anything. What we do is not determined by anything. And we determine our own actions. Do you begin to see the problem?
Free will demands that we determine our own actions. It means that I determine what I do. Or my actions are originated by me or caused by me. It doesn't matter. Or are made necessary by processes in my brain, that, by what I, my decisions. It doesn't matter what you call it. Okay? It results in determining. It's just a, another word for determinism. Indeterminism says nothing determines anything. Well, if your actions can't be determined, if nothing determines anything, can you determine your own actions? So, the conclusion is, the inevitable conclusion, at least in my opinion the conclusion is, libertarianism contradicts itself. Now in this, I definitely disagree with Donald Palmer because in the text, Donald Palmer appears to be a volitional libertarian. That is, he, he writes sympathetically about uh, libertarianism and seems contemptuous or dismissive of soft determinism and hard determinism. He seems uh, dismissive of, of other views um, and sympathetic to libertarianism. And I personally believe, for, for these reasons and others, that libertarianism cannot be true. That libertarianism contradicts itself. That it's no more likely to be true than it is like there is likely to be a square circle or a married bachelor. Not just physically impossible, this is a logically impossible claim. Now, um, so, and I'm going to try and illustrate this by talking about something. Um, So, I'm going to try and illustrate this by talking about Palmer's reaction to Heisenberg. Heisenberg wrote specifically about uh, indeterminism. You know, there's this thing called the indeterminacy principle. And Heisenberg interpreted quantum mechanics in an, uh, in an a-causal way. He interpreted quantum mechanics as saying that there is no fact of the matter that will determine what will happen next in some situations. That there's actual true <laughs> randomness at a certain level of um, physical existence. Now I want to emphasize this is an interpretation. There's no mathematical or evidential support for this. This is just Heisenberg's interpretation of his results. And I've talked to physicists and some say, and, and the, what I get is that some people believe in quantum indeterminacy. Other physicists don't believe in it. Most don't care. And it doesn't seem to matter mathematically. The, th the theory works either way. That's as far as I've been able to, to tell. If you find an actual physics professor who knows about this, they'll probably know better than I would. Um, but Heisenberg said indeterminism could give free will. And he wrote papers about this. And, and then people said, but Werner, think about what you're saying. 
you're saying that something uncaused in the brain, something the brain does not originate, something that appears in the brain from nowhere, could give a person free will. What is the re actual result of a random event in your brain? A random event that results in an action. Well, it's a spasm. Or jumping through a window. You go to a, a McDonald's intending to order a Big Mac. And you want a Big Mac, you've decided to order a Big Mac, you have the volition to order a Big Mac, but you slap the guy instead, or you do a little chicken dance, or you do something completely at random. That's what indeterminism means. And you look in the textbook, Palmer seems to understand this, at least at that point, by showing a picture of a guy throwing himself to the end of saying, is this a free act? Well, no, not really. It's not an action at all. It's just an event. It's something that happened at random. It is certainly not something the person chose to do. Your actions are things that you choose to do. Having quantum indeterminacy in your head would be kind of like having a Gilles de Tourette syndrome. You tick and twitch. And in fact, if there was a lot of randomness in your head, it would be like having a grand mal seizure. You would have no control over your body. You'd fall to the ground limp. And you're, you would not have a mind as long as that happened. You, your mind would go away. It's only as long as your brain is deterministic that it works in a regular way. So indeterminism destroys free will. It doesn't save it. It kills it. Determinism, which is true randomness. Stuff happens for no reason whatsoever. Kills free will. Now, Palmer's response to this is very peculiar. is very peculiar, and I think it really illustrates the need to put things in your own words and use consistent terminology. So I'm going to write that off to the side here. Put things in your own words. And so when you come across something important in the text, take it and put it in your own words. And use consistent terminology, by which I mean use the same word for the same thing every time you write about that thing. Don't change the word you use for a particular thing. Different things get different words. If it's the same thing, you're writing about the same thing multiple times, always use the same word. Because if you don't, you get into trouble. And I'm going to illustrate that right now. Palmer. Um, I'm going to do this in red or pink. Hold on. Oops. I guess I'm using pink. Mm. All right. Palmer says something like necessity is the opposite of. Freedom. Necessity is the is the opposite of freedom. 
Now, this kind of looks, kind of, might look kind of plausible, but it is actually deeply mistaken. Because you have to think about what we are talking about in, the chap in this chapter. What is Palmer using the word necessity to refer to? If Palmer used a consistent, precise terminology, what word would be here? If Palmer used consistent, precise terminology, or if we interpreted this, we looked about how um, free will is actually destroyed, what word would go here? And then Palmer draws this diagram. And it goes like this. He says, but there are not just two components to this formula, but three. And he draws the diagram. He's got here, he's got necessity. And over here he has randomness. And over here he has freedom. And this diagram makes it look like there are three possibilities. You could be in a state of necessity. That is, your actions could occur under necessity. Your actions could occur, occur under randomness, all this chaos stuff. Or they could occur under conditions of freedom. But what does freedom mean in this graph? Because we're just talking about determinism and indeterminism. And the fact that indeterminism, lack of determinism, destroys free will. If you examine the Heisenberg example, Heisenberg failed to, stop, to say free will because indeterminism kills it. In fact, but Palmer says that doesn't matter. Although necessity is the opposite of freedom, there are not just two components, but three. Well, let's translate this. Okay. First, the easy one. What is it that kills free will? Undoubtedly, it's coercion. We know that coercion kills free will. If you're walking down the street and someone puts a gun in your face and says, give me all your money, or hand over your wallet, if you hand over your wallet because you don't want to get shot, you did that, and in a sense that was your will to do that, but you did it to avoid a terrible result, so it was not your free will. You were not free to do otherwise. You could not have done otherwise if you had wanted to. If you would wanted to not give the wallet, he'd have shot you and took your wallet anyway. So that's what um, free will means to everybody outside of a philosophy classroom. It's acting without coercion. That's what free will means in a court of law. So in terms of coercion, freedom is absence of coercion. We'll cross that out. Now, <coughs> necessity has two possible meanings in this context. And one is necessity is the presence of coercion. And we could certainly say that coercion is the opposite of the absence of coercion, or coercion is the opposite of freedom, right? But was Palmer talking about coercion in this page, on this page. Was he talking about coercion in the, uh, in the Heisenberg example? Right? He talked about indeterminacy, indeterminism. He didn't say, well, without coercion you'll do random stuff like throw yourself through the window. He said, without determinism you do random stuff. So, you might say kind of, sort of, that necessity, like, it was necessary for me to give him my wallet 
so he wouldn't shoot him. That was necessary to avoid death. That's one use of the word necessity. But nobody denies that 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 kind of necessity removes free will. Nobody I know says that coercion does not remove free will. I've never heard that. I've never heard anyone say coercion does not remove freedom. I have heard people say, and I have said many times, determinism does not remove freedom. Determinism is not the opposite of freedom. And so, and Palmer is trying to argue that determinism rules out free will and that lack of determinism does not rule out free will. So he says necessity is the opposite of freedom. He's got to mean determinism. Which is wrong. My view, it's wrong. Now, if he meant, if he took, came in this classroom and said, no, no, I meant that coercion is the opposite of freedom, I'd say, well, I agree with you. Coercion is the opposite of freedom. But if he's arguing against, if he's trying to argue that determinism is incompatible with free will, or that indeterminism does not rule out free will, he has to be talking about determinism here. Why bring in coercion? So determinism is not the opposite of free will. Coercion is the opposite of free will. Determinism is not. Because we're talking about. All right, so what is this thing about necessity, randomness, and freedom? In all this way through the book, Palmer has never used the word necessity to refer to coercion. He's always used it to refer to determinism, and so that's the way he's using it now. And this is what I mean about using consistent terminology. If he'd used the word determinism throughout, we wouldn't have to worry about interpreting this. We'd know what he's saying. So now I have to figure out what he's saying with this diagram. So necessity is determinism. Right. What's randomness in this picture? Why is there the word randomness here? Well, he's referring to the Heisenberg thing of the guy throwing himself through the window instead of walking across the room, or slapping the guy in the Baskin Robbins instead of ordering ice cream, or you know, elbowing the person behind you for no reason whatsoever. That's randomness. So what is randomness in this context? Well, randomness is just a state of not determinism. And what is freedom here? How is he interpreting freedom here? He's not interpreting it as lack of coercion, because neither of these is coercion. If freedom is lack of coercion, you have freedom with coercion and no lines connecting it to randomness or necessity. What is freedom here? Well, freedom is a state that's not this, and not this. Let's write that out. It's not determinism and not not determinism. It's not determinism and it's not not determinism. <coughs> it's freedom. Is freedom deterministic or not deterministic? No. 
It's not deterministic, and it's not not deterministic. How the hell can, how does that work? Does Palmer give an example of a system that is free? No, he doesn't. He does not give an example of a, of a system that is not this, that is not necessity, and not randomness at the same time. So this is a logical self-contradiction. And he says, he tries to save libertarianism by saying there's a third state that's not determinism and not indeterminism. It's called freedom. And in it, you're not deterministic and you're not random. And that just does not work. He's violating the law of the excluded middle. This is why I think that libertarianism is a self-contradictory doctrine, that it actually contradicts itself. Now, there's another thing that follows from this, because lack of determinism Kills. It kills free will. Incompatibilism. doctrine that determinism rules out free will itself kills free will. If incompatible, or to put it another way, if incompatibilism is true, there is no free will. If incompatibilism is true, there is no free will. So if Palmer is an incompatibilist, an inevitable consequence of his view is that there is no free will. To be an incompatibilist and a free willist is a self-contradiction. <clears throat> okay, so I think I'm, I, I went over these arguments before, but I'm going to do it again. We have two arguments about free will and determinism. And B.F. Skinner. Donald Palmer and B.F. Skinner. I don't know if Palmer actually has this argument, but I found it in his book, so I'm attributing it to him. Now, um, the concept of free will is inextricably linked to the concept of moral responsibility. So if we find ourselves disbelieving in free will, it follows that we should not believe in moral responsibility. And I'm going to try and illustrate that with two arguments here. Um, the first premise is the same for both arguments. Um, I'm 
putting this in red so to, to show that it's kind of scary. Or at least it's one, it's a, it's a premise that I regard as dodgy, something that needs some support. So that's the controversial premise. They also share another premise. Responsibility requires free will. The claim is moral responsibility requires free will, and I put that in black because I think that's right. If we're going to attribute moral responsibility to somebody, if someone takes money out of the bank, um, out of the bank vault and hands it to someone else who it doesn't belong to, um, we, it's a question of the, que the question of that bank teller's moral responsibility depends on whether they were coerced into doing it. If someone was forced to hand over money to, uh, to a robber, say by a gun to the head or, or threatening the person's children or, or something like that, some form of coercion, then we say it's not their free will and either they're, they're, they're not morally responsible or their responsibility is diminished. Right? If you do something uh, bad of your own free will, you are more morally responsible than if you did not do it of your own free will, if you were coerced into it. If you do something bad because it gives you money, that's morally wrong. If you do something bad to avoid being shot, that's less morally wrong or morally okay. Does that make sense? Is this how we make sense of moral responsibility? So moral responsibility requires free will. Now, I've got a couple of other premises I want to put in here. And then I'm going to put um, another premise sort of in, in black here, because I think that this is a... Now, There's a curious asymmetry. I call this five just for symmetry. Oh well, three, four. There's a curious symmetry here, asymmetry here, because on the Palmer side, one of the premises seems to be I remember a conversation I had a long time ago with a fellow graduate student at uh, UCI and I was explaining that I thought that determinism was compatible with free will and he said, well, what about moral responsibility? And I said, well, moral responsibility is perfectly fine. Since determinism is compatible with free will, we can have moral responsibility and uh, even though there's no uh, determinism is true. Determinism doesn't rule out free will, so it doesn't rule out moral responsibility. And then he said, but what about the people who say that moral responsibility requires determinism not to be true? That, that moral responsibility requires free will and determinism rules out free will? And I'm like, they're wrong. Moral responsibility is not a problem for determinism, I said, because I thought, and it just seemed really weird to me that he thought that this was an argument against my view. Why would the existence of moral responsibility somehow magically make determinism and free will incompatible with each other? 
So, uh, I never did understand that. Right. So, um, on this side there's the premise that moral responsibility exists. On this side, the premise is determinism is true. By determinism, I mean true all the way down. Volitional determinism. The parts of your brain that make you do stuff <coughs> are deterministic. And then he draws the conclusion here, determinism is false. And Skinner draws the conclusion Moral responsibility does not exist. Now, if this premise is true, certainly one of these arguments is right. If, it, if, moral, if incompatibilism is true and moral responsibility requires free will, then either determinism is false and moral responsibility does not exist. Now, there's another difference between the two arguments. Because over here on the Skinner side, I can put in something else. I can put in, for instance, that there is tons oops, <coughs> and tons <coughs> and tons and tons of evidence for volitional <coughs> determinism. <coughs> and I can put in an extra pro a premise that Skinner himself didn't put in, but I can put this one in. Um, Human will is only possible under determinism. You can only have a human will under determinism. And you, we act on our will. We make decisions and we act on those decisions. That's only possible if the determinism is true in the most important place in our brains. Because if those, the volition forming system was indeterministic, it wouldn't be a system, it wouldn't achieve anything, we would not form will. We would not form volitions. We would not have it. Right. And we do have a will, so that actually supports the idea that the human brain is deterministic. I have control of my own actions, and my actions are the result of my personality, my character, my wants and desires. Right. My actions are the result of who I am, not of anyone else. As long as I don't have a gun to my head, what I do depends on what I think and decide and feel. Yeah, please Infinite regress. At some point, can you explain that? Infinite. Does it have anything to do with any of this? Um, that will come up later. Okay. The infinite I'll regress wait. will come up later. Okay. Right. That will come up after the break when we talk about all the arguments, or purported arguments, for incompatibilism. Right What's now, I'm talking about the consequences of incompatibilism. And the consequences of incompatibilism is <coughs> if incompatibilism is true, either determinism is false and moral responsibility does not exist, and we have tons and tons and tons and tons of, uh, of evidence for determinism in humans. Lot, a large portion of human behavior is predictable, which means it's determined, 
And the more you know about a person, the more you can predict what they will do. Human beings are, are infinitely complex, so you can't predict everything that they can do. But to the extent you know what they do, <coughs> they're, they're, they're deterministic. And we do not experience us as, ourselves as doing random stuff. We don't experience ourselves as doing stuff we never wanted to do. Every time we do stuff, even stuff that we don't understand why we did it, there's a reason. If we investigate and we can find out, we can usually find out there's a reason. We don't think of ourselves as acting at random. All right. Is there any evidence that moral responsibility exists? What would that evidence be? There's tons of evidence that people believe in moral responsibility. But there's tons of evidence that people believe uh, that Muhammad is, the, is the, the last and one true prophet of God. Um, there are lots of people who believe in fairies and ghosts and trickle-down economics. And um, that people believe that welfare magically causes dependency. Um, there are people who believe in lots and lots of things that are not at all supported by evidence. And there are people who believe in things we know are not true. So the fact that people believe in moral responsibility is not evidence for the existence of moral responsibility. It's ad, that's an ad populum fallacy. So what reasons do we have to think that moral responsibility exists? I mean, you know, I actually believe this personally. But if you ask me to prove that moral responsibility actually exists, I'm going to have a hard time doing it. I would have to really sit down and think and, and look stuff up and, and read philosophy and, and try and find arguments for this. And uh, I would come up with an I could come up with an argument. I'm pretty sure I could come up with some argument, and I'm pretty sure I could come up with an argument that would make sense to me. But I can't guarantee that it would make sense to you, and it certainly would not have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of evidence for volitional deter for, for it. And it would not have anything like, well, if there was no, if, if we didn't have moral responsibility, humans couldn't act at all. Nothing of anything remotely approaching the strength of this. In fact, what we have here is sort of a big empty space. There are no premises here. Palmer certainly doesn't give any premises. It's hard to see how this could be filled. So, if we like the idea that moral responsibility exists, this is the premise we have to break. Right? If incompatibilism is true, there is no moral responsibility. And there's no way out of that. Because if indeterminism is true, there is no risk free will, so there's no moral responsibility. The only hope of having moral responsibility is if determinism doesn't rule it out. And I want to argue that there are very, very good reasons for thinking that determinism does not rule out free will. Uh, and I'm going to try and um, try and motivate this discussion with a sort of visual metaphor. So here's, here's my sort of basic argument for compatibilism, the idea that incompatibilism is false. Basic initial argument for compatibilism. Now, I'm going to say that this does not by itself, I don't think that this by itself proves compatibilism. There's a bit of more work, a bit more work that has to be done after this. But here's the basic, basic framework. Um, and I call this basic argument the incompatibilism gap.
the incompatibilism gap, and this is how it works. For incompatibilism to be true, there has to be a logical chain from determinism is true to something to free will doesn't exist. Most of the time that I run into incompatibilists, they say, if determinism is true, free will doesn't exist. And I say, why? Why? How does determinism rule out free will? And they say, well, if determinism, if our actions are caused, then we don't, we're not doing them, so uh, free will doesn't exist. And I say, why? Well, how does our actions being caused <coughs> make them not our actions? And they never come up, they generally they don't come up with a response to this. The argument for there seems to be something like, well, did you ever see these um, underpants gnomes episode of South Park? Right? They, these, these gnomes go into kids' rooms and they steal underpants and they collect them in vast underground cabins where there's piles and piles and piles of stolen underpants. And their business plan is collect underpants, <coughs> question mark, profit. That's their business plan. And Incompatibilism, in general, most of the time, seems to me to be saying determinism is true. Free will doesn't exist. So I've got the idea of the incompatibilism uh, gap. It's like a box. Something has to go in that box that relates determinism to free will not existing. Something has to go in there that is not simply a repeat of determinism rules out free will in other words. So, now by contrast, there is no such thing as a gap when we can consider indeterminism. Right, if we have indeterminism is true, Well, free will, will is when we determine our own actions. You can't get around this. There's no such thing as a definition of free will that doesn't include the concept of determinant, determinism, that we determine our own actions. We decide what we do. We cause ourselves to, to do certain things, particular things that have come out of our characters or our desires, who we are, fixes what we do. All these are synonyms for determinism. We originate our own actions. It means we determine our own actions. Indeterminism means nothing is determined. If nothing is determined, our actions cannot be determined by us. If nothing is caused, 
if there's a causality, we can't cause our own actions. Basic contradiction. The idea of indeterminism contradicts the idea of free will, once you understand what free will is actually saying. So there's no gap when we're talking about indeterminism. Indeterminism is incompatible with free will, and we can prove it by this. Now, I've set up this thing for the incompatibilism gap, but I haven't looked at all the arguments for incompatibilism, and that's the second part of it, is we have to look at all the arguments for incompatibilism and see if they fill the incompatibilism gap. This needs to be filled with something that is not simply a restatement of incompatibilism. If you just write, determinism rules out free will, well, I'm going to ask, can you prove that determinism rules out free will? Can you prove that determinism means that free will doesn't exist? And there, there's the gap. Right? You can't fill the gap by pretending it doesn't exist. what goes in there has to be clearly true. If it's something false, it's not going to work. We have to have something true. Remember but for, in, uh, for um, indeterminism, we know that free will is when we determine what we do. We, that our actions are up to us and they're not random. Indeterminism says act, things are random. So if an action is random, it's not our action. It's not up to us. It's not up to anything. So the common sense view of free will is ruled out by indeterminism. Is it also ruled out by determinism? Now I'm going to look at some arguments that purport to fill the gap. Okay, so um, any questions so far? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go straight to the I'm going to go to the Van Inwagen consequence argument. So I want everyone to have a picture of the incompatibilism gap, and I'm going to see if Van Inwagen or, or someone else can um, can fill it. All right. So. Uh, Van in Wagen. Can I borrow your textbook again? Uh, page, page 238. And I need my glasses. Alright. If determinism is true, then our acts are the consequences of the laws of nature and events in the remote past. So this is Van in Wagon.
All right, now remember what I said when I was um, defining determinism, that if, uh, there was another universe that started out at the same time ours did and was absolutely identical, exactly similar to, that other, uh, to our universe in every respect. If that, uh, if that had happened, there would be in that other universe a classroom exactly like this one with a professor exactly like me doing exactly what I do, waving his glasses around and having this uh, black hat on the table and recording the lecture and all this stuff. Everything would be exactly the same. If the universe is fully deterministic, if that universe is fully deterministic, has the same laws of nature and the same starting point, you get the same result. That's what determinism says. Same starting point, same result. Even slightly different starting point, all bets are up. Could be a wildly different result. In order to have a different result, you have to have a different starting point. You do have to have a different starting position. But same starting position, same result. And what this means, right, if determinism is true, our actions are the consequences of the laws of nature and remote past events. That things that happen, what we're doing now, what we're doing now, the, the, whatever it is that you're doing right this second, the tiny, minutest motion, a blink of the eyes, a movement of the fingers, touching one hand with the other, you know, <laughs> uh, you know playing with the pens, or the, whatever the little tiny thing that we're doing, that is a consequence of remotely past events and the laws of nature. And this is true, I believe. Um, Certainly, if determinism is completely true, it's true. And that actually does not bother me at all, but it uh, bothers some people. Natural laws and um, natural laws and past events are not up to us. Well, they can't be up to us, can they? They happened before we were born. We can't influence the past. I mean, I can't influence the past, no matter how hard I try. Uh, I've never been able to successfully build a, a time machine. So I, I can't alter the past. I certainly can't um, change the laws of physics. So, past events are not up to us. I'm going to put this as a premise. Just sort of reiterating one, our own actions are among the natural consequences of those remotely past events. And this is, this is certainly in a sense true. Uh, I wouldn't argue this. What I'm doing now is a consequence of things that happened, uh, uh, consequences of various things and situations happened before I was born. I'm going to put this in red because I don't agree with it. I agree with these three premises, but I don't agree with this conclusion. Oh. 
And this says that our own actions are not up to us if determinism is true. So he's saying, this is, a, this is another statement of incompatibilism, that our actions are not up to us. If determinism is true, our actions are not up to us. And here's his argument. Determinism, if determinism is true, then our actions are the consequences of the laws of nature and of past events. Natural law and past events are not up to us. And to emphasize, our own actions are among the natural consequences of these remotely past events right, that we could not influence. Therefore, our own actions are not up to us. But I think that this requires a fourth premise, that it needs something to connect this to this. It's true, our own acts are among the natural consequences of these remotely past events. This requires this premise, that there's no significant difference between our actions and other consequences of remote past events. Now, outside it's either raining or it's not. If it is raining, that's a consequence of remote past events and the laws of nature, right, if determinism is true. If it's not raining, that too is the consequence of remote past events. The moon may or not be, well the moon is out there, and the moon is in a certain position, I don't know where it is, but the moon's wherever it's at, and wherever it's at, that's a consequence of remote past events. And certainly, that I didn't put the moon where it is, I'm not responsible for where the moon is now, I'm not responsible for it being raining or not raining, I can't claim credit for that, those are not my actions. My actions are waving my hands like an idiot and giving this lecture and setting up that uh, video camera and wearing these glasses and, and, and everything else I did. Okay, and failing, failing to put up a study guide for today, I, for which I again apologize. Now, I certainly believe that there's a significant difference between stuff I do and other stuff that happens that I didn't do. But this says there's no significant difference. So, if I want to knock down this argument, I have to kill this premise. I have to prove this wrong. I have to come up with something that is a significant difference between my actions and actions that are other consequences, things that are other consequences of past events. Right. So got that? That's what I gotta do. I gotta kill this premise. I'm gonna try to kill this premise. Remember, this says there is no significant difference between our actions and other consequences of remote past events. I say, I'm claiming that this is the premise that Van Inwagen needs in his argument, for his argument to work. Because if there is a significant <coughs> difference, then his argument doesn't prove that our actions are not up to us. And what are we anyway? What is the us in this sentence? So, here's another way of looking at it. Actually, I should say. All 
Right, so you're familiar with domino causality. The idea you knock over one domino, it knocks over the next, knocks over the next, and da 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 all the way down. And in a closed system with no outside interference, every time you set up the dominoes in the same way, you get the same result. And what when and Wagen is saying, there are <coughs> at, there are things that happen that are <coughs> consequences are so these, these lines I'm drawing now are like causal chains coming down to the front. There, that's why it's raining or not raining. This is the one that put the moon where it's at. There's various things, causal chains that come down from the past. And here's us. We have. Why not? Um, here's us, and here is all this stuff that's happening that's not up to us. <coughs> and I'm going to draw in lines for our actions. Now, if Van Inwagen is right, the lines that for our actions just come out and have nothing to do with us, right? They're just like the other stuff that happens around us. Our actions are consequences of things that have come into the from the past and they're not up to us. Does this picture make sense? I don't think it makes sense. And I want to draw that I'm going to redraw it. There are things that happened in the remote past that led to you being born. And here you are as a baby. You're a happy child. There are things that happen that lead to you being born. You start to exist. And then, you continue to exist down to the present. Here you are in the present. Still happy. And, and, and stunningly good looking, of course. Um, and as things go on, things happen to you. And you do stuff. Stuff comes out of you, right? You, at every point of the chain, you're doing things and affecting the universe. <laughs> if, it, if it rings again, tell, tell them they've reached NORAD. <laughs> and ask them when, you want, when they want you to launch. <laughs> Do you have a launch order? Right, and stuff's happening to you, and you're doing stuff, and stuff's happening to you, and you're doing stuff, and you do actions, right? You are an object in space and time. Now, how do we talk about this in real life? Well, let's think about bears. Right? If you go, if you're walking through the woods and you step in something that a bear left in the woods, do you say that was caused by remote events in the remote past and the laws of nature, uh, or do you say a bear did that? Presuming that, you know, assuming that you have the, you know, the, the, the recognition guy that tells you what kind of stuff it is you just stepped in. Right. You say a bear did it. Right. You say a bear did it. The bear did it. Um, there are trees out in the woods, I'm not sure about this, but there are trees out in the woods that are all, have all the bark rubbed off them because bears come in there and use them as scratching posts. Do you say, that was caused by the laws of nature and events in the past? Or do you say, a bear did that? You say, a bear did that. Um, what if you're going outside and you see uh, the wall of a building with uh, spray-painted graffiti? Do you say, 
Um, do you say a bear did that? No, do you say uh, that was caused by events in the remote past and the laws of nature? Or do you say that's a tagger? Um, that was a person. A person did that. Right? That that was up to that person. So, we attribute the actions of thinking beings to those beings. And we don't, we don't have this, our actions are not things that happen independently of us. Our actions are things that happen through us. And it's, yes, we were formed by events in the, we were formed by events in the remote past and the laws of nature. And our consequences are, in some sense, our actions are, in some sense, the consequences of those, in every sense, they're the, they're the consequence of those things. But, we should not ignore the fact that they're still our actions. And these actions are generated by a brain. We have a brain that is formed by, you know, DNA operating in your mother's womb and then in your head. There's this complicated physiochemical, biochemical reaction that makes your brain and makes it operate, right? And your brain is an object, and your brain generates volitions. And yes, those volitions are consequences of that, but they're the actions of your brain. Oh, Somebody call 911? No, not from no. here. That phone rang, but we hung it up. I guess somebody accidentally picked it up, dialed 911. Went, uh, I didn't do that. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 I was, I was watching her, she did not turn around and pick up the phone and then <laughs> press, press that. Uh, here, check it. Right. All right, thanks. Okay. okay, that might have been a genuinely uncaused action that did not happen because of any physical thing that happened. If it is, it might be the, hopefully it's the only one. Uh, so, I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> so, we have a thing. So, the normal way of saying it is that look, this is a, an object that's created by the universe that does stuff. And Van Inwagen's argument ignores all of that. We have a very different situation from here and here. These events are. Uh, 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 consequences of events that are from the remote past and laws of nature and are definitely not up to us because we're not involved. But the stuff we're involved in is up to us. That's what it means. Right. Um, if you, let me put it this way, if you have a subordinate or you're, you're training someone or you're, you're raising a child and you want them to, to negotiate and learn how to negotiate a, uh, a situation, you let them make decisions, right? Sometimes you let someone else make decisions, and then they live with the consequences of their actions, and that, that feeds back into there, and they hopefully make better, if they do it wrong, hopefully they make better decisions later on, right? The learning curve, the learning process, right? So, when someone makes a decision, you're taking a, a machine, a person, a machine, a, a biological machine, putting them in a situation and letting them go. What they do is what they do. There's a decision-making process going on that decides what they're going to do. So their decisions are up to us in the only mean, meaningful sense of that. The fact that we are created and caused by forces that came before us which we could not possibly control doesn't mean that once we exist we do not control our own actions. So I think Van in Wagen is wrong, he's just oversimplifying and the detail he leaves out is the detail that proves him wrong when you put it back in. Okay, so let's take a 15 minute break.